This is Roy Firestone. Welcome to Firestone Chats. Tonight, a look back before he was king. Michael Jordan at 21. Our first interview with a young man on the verge of sports immortality. It was April 1984. Michael had just finished his junior year at North Carolina, coming off a national title, winning the John Wooden Award, emblematic as college basketball's player of the year. I asked him about his early years in high school basketball. Let's backtrack for a moment. You didn't make a high school basketball team. Now you're the nation's college, nation's best college player. Well, I didn't make my varsity, and that was a big thing in high school. And uh, I wasn't that good. I was at the height of six one, and I really didn't develop my abilities until after I grew. Michael, what were you eating that you can sprout up four inches like that? I don't know. It, whatever I was eating, it was good, and it helped me out a bit. <laughs> They call you the rabbit. That's one of the nicknames you had growing up. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about this guy. He worked so hard. One year he was running a 4.640. From one year to the next, he, he knocked that down from a 4.640 to a 4.340. You work very, very hard, and you work very hard in your basketball skills as well. It's been very important to you, right? I just think that I have the habits of working hard. I've I always been taught that to reach a goal that in life that you want, you have to work hard to get to it. And so far, I just, you know, have that in mind. You are the third of five children in your family. Uh, you come from a very, very close family. Your brother Larry, though, who is only five foot seven inches, was your big hero. In fact, he was your main inspiration. Is that not right? Yeah, he did. Uh, Larry used to be a, a very talented basketball player. He still is. And whenever I was about his height, he used to wear me out in the backyard. And uh, I guess from that determination just to beat him, uh, I guess that uh, made me work hard. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, he's just an outstanding basketball player at his height. People uh, discuss all the times the academic as well as the athletic aspects of this game. You have to be a rare story because you weren't necessarily recruited by North Carolina, though they were interested in you. But you went to the campus yourself because you wanted to see for yourself what the school is about academically, right? Yeah. Um, I didn't, well, North Carolina wasn't recruiting me at this time. Uh, I had this uh, Project Uplift, which is an uh, organization where uh, I mean, high school students get the chance to go to colleges and just see how it's like. And mm -hmm. I got the chance to visit North Carolina, and I saw not just the, the bad side, but I saw the good side also. And I wasn't shielded away from the university, as a lot of schools do. Mm -hmm. So I got to see the whole university within itself without the coaches knowing. Once upon a time, you were an NC State fan. In <laughs> fact, you were not a big fan of North Carolina. You were a David Thompson fan, and you rooted against North Carolina State, all, uh, North Carolina, I should say, all the time. I was a very avid NC State fan. I really liked them very much. I was really a David Thompson fan with his style of play, and I just couldn't stand Carolina. I, I don't <laughs> know why. It was a, it's just something that I didn't like about Carolina. And you know, I, when I got the chance to visit both schools, then I saw the family like atmosphere in North Carolina that fitted me well. I think that the University of North Carolina really gave me uh, all the different fundamentals that I've learned about basketball and uh, little things about life. I think mm. they really taught me a lot. of. This is a quote from Dean Smith. He said, of you, he doesn't come out and say I'm better than you, but somewhere something comes through that he feels he is better as a player. Is that fair, do you think? I don't know. Uh, I think it's fair coming from Coach Smith. Uh, <laughs> He's a, a coach that finds a lot of weaknesses in your in your game, and he wants you to improve on your weaknesses. And you know, he he will find a weakness until you graduate. And you know, coming from him, I think that's a fair statement. He was a whirling dervish of spins, dunks, and soaring. But it's interesting to talk to Michael about the first time he dunked a basketball. Williston High School against D.C. Virgo. You remember the night? You were five foot nine inches, a ninth grader, and you were a junior high school dunking for the first time. Didn't not, know I did it. Not a lot of junior high school kids can dunk, especially at five. But feet. everybody tries now. <laughs> I bet Everybody now. tries. <laughs> you remember the night when, when the fans went, ooh and ah, and, and it really kind of powered you. It was almost like a, like a natural athletic high. Right. Um, I was, I remember I, I'd gotten a steal. Um, I was on the break, and I've been trying in practice and for so many times, and I never seemed to do it. And I guess the intensity of the fans and of the game, I went up to lay it in, not to dunk it, but to lay it in. And I felt that I was high enough to dunk the ball. And I kind of just flipped it over and dunked it. And it was a baby dunk, but it was a dunk. You didn't, you didn't do one of those 
parallel to the basket things or anything no, like that? No, oh, okay. no, no. <laughs> <laughs> Remember watching TV when you were a kid and seeing Dr. J and saying, I want to be like this guy. I've seen Dr. J. I mean, he was an epitome of a lot of kids. I mean, when you, when you thought of the NBA, you thought of Dr. J. Uh, that's how much he meant to the game. He carried that label for that long, and everyone wanted to see him dunk the ball. Uh, so I think his dunks really inspired a lot of people besides myself. Air Jordan talked about what grounded him. For all of the things that you have going for you in life, and it is considerable, I mean, you are the Michael Jackson of professional <laughs> sports, oh, all of sports, truly, that you don't ever lose sight of the fact that, my God, I love playing this game. I, I love the fact that I can virtually have anything I want, but I never forget who I am. You are anchored to that belief. And that comes from my parents, I think. Uh, you know, it's, it's great. I love the game of basketball, and I feel that, that if I didn't get paid right now, I still play the game of basketball without a doubt. And I don't want to ever lose that love. If I do, then I want to quit. I know this is a business. I know a lot of people make a lot of money in, in the game of basketball, but no one can uh, express or pay the love that I have for the game uh, because I've done it for so many years. And uh, it's, yeah, it's just brought me some riches and it's brought me some, uh, some different things, uh, but I still owe basketball a lot and I still love the game. My parents really got me into sports. Uh, they got us into sports. My brother and I just, you know, maybe to keep us off the streets and, you know, we never got into drugs or certain things like that. So, you know, I guess that was a big, important part of life uh, where we did play sports. And, you know, they really supported us a great deal. Like my parents, they really, they haven't missed the game that I played at UNC. And, and I, they also have seen you play in Greece and Hawaii. Is that true? Yeah, it's amazing. They have, they had the opportunity to go to Greece, Hawaii, and San Francisco. And, you know, it's, I guess, a vacation for them. They never had the opportunity to do it when we was at home. But now it's no one at home now, and they get the chance to move. Had some stories with Phil Ford uh, growing up in North Carolina saying that early on in his life, you know, he experienced racial prejudice. You ever experienced anything like that? Not, not at UNC, I haven't. Uh, I don't think that I have uh, anywhere else. I just think that I really don't worry about racial uh, differences. I just think that, um, you know, I'm enjoying life, and uh, I don't see any racial problem here for me. How positive do you think sports is towards, you know, unifying races? Is it overplayed? Is it overrated, do you think, in some respects? I think it's overplayed a little bit. I don't think it's as much a racial problem as people think. You know, mm -hmm. I think a lot of black and white uh, players get along with each other. Um, unfortunately, you see a lot more black professionals than white. And, you know, I, you really just can't control that. It's just their ability and, and what uh, people see. And a lot of people take that for granted. Of course, Jordan would leave basketball to pursue a dream to play pro baseball. But way back in 1984, he told me of his love of the game. I know that deep down, baseball might be your first love. Billy Martin is one of your inspirations and your biggest heroes. Now, people would say, Michael Jordan, he loves Billy Martin. How could that be? I just like his controversial attitude. He always aroused uh, the fans and still maintains a, a good record. How good a baseball player were you? I wasn't that good. <laughs> oh, now we hear differently. I was pretty good. Uh, I played baseball ever since I was uh, seven, and I continued to play up until my 11th grade year. What position? I, I pitched and I played center field, mm. first base. I was somewhat utility man. Yeah. But uh, I just enjoyed playing, and I did get a couple of offers along with my basketball offers, and I just gave it up once I got to college. He would go on to earn two gold medals for two different U.S. Olympic basketball teams. Back then, he was trying out for the first time. I think it's going to be a really thrill just to go out and try out. I think it's, it's going to be a very competitive trial, as it was for the Pan Am. Yeah. And uh, it's just like uh, everyone's going to come out and give that extra 10% just to make the team. And you have to be ready to play during that time. And it's really a long grind. I mean, it's two, three games at a clip every, almost every other day or every day. Uh, it's, it's unlike college basketball. Yeah, it's unlike college basketball. But if you love the game, you can you you dedicated to it. I just love to play, and I think I can handle playing three games. Love does not just this game, but all sports. This is a sports junkie, folks. I'm talking <laughs> about a stock car racing fan, baseball fan, love football. Do you ever want to be a sportscaster, perhaps? No, I think that's out of out of my <laughs> league. But I, I would like to, you know, if I had the talent to play a lot of sports. But uh, I just enjoy just watching and, and being able to contribute to sports.
The fiery Bob Knight was Jordan's first Olympic coach. Did you know in 84 that he was going to become the stellar player? My oldest son, Tim, was a gopher at the uh, sports festival in Syracuse when Jordan was a senior in high school that following summer. And he came home from there and he went through all the players that attended. And when he got to Jordan, he said, Dad, this is going to be the best player you've ever seen. And I really didn't know who Jordan was at that time. He was a 6'4 high school kid from North Carolina. What year is this? That, uh, this would have been uh, 81, I think, uh, and, and uh, that Dean had recruited. And so I called Dean, and I said, uh, tell me about Michael Jordan. Dean wanted, well, why are you asking? So I told him the story about Tim. And he said, well, he said, I hope he's as good as Tim thinks he is. And obviously he was better than anybody thought he was. And, and when you look at that team, uh, it, it starts with Jordan. It doesn't really end with Mike, though. Jordan, I'll tell you an interesting thing about Jordan. I took him aside once, and obviously Dean Smith and I have different approaches and talk about things. And, and yet, I think the end result that we both try to achieve is the same. Uh, and, and, uh, and Michael knew that, and, and he knew that immediately. And uh, he used to, he had, a, he had a great line. Uh, people used to ask him, well, what about Coach Knight and Coach Smith? And uh, Michael's line was, we know, he said, they, they go about things a little differently. Uh, he said, Coach Smith is the master of the four-corner offense, and Coach Knight has mastered the four-letter word. <laughs> and yet the results each is trying to get are the same. And I always really appreciate it. Is he a favorite of yours personally? Oh, sure. I mean, the guy's just, uh, I, I, told, uh, I told Jordan very early, I said, now, Mike, don't ever question whether I get on you or not. I said, sometimes I'm going to get on you. And if you think about it, what you're going to say is, what the hell is he getting on me for? I, and, and you're going to be right. But there are going to be times when I can say something to you that everybody else is going to say, wow. I mean, he's upset with Jordan. I mean, how's, and, and, and he was great. I mean, so in a way, you used Jordan a little bit sure. to, make, to make a point. And, and, and he, he didn't, and he didn't, and he didn't, and he understood that, and he wanted to win, and he knew what we were trying to do was, was, uh, was essential to our being able to win. I've never, uh, I've had a, an opportunity to coach a lot of great kids, uh, none better than Jordan. Uh, By the way, I know what you think about earrings. Michael Jordan wears an earring. <laughs> no, that, that's some, that, you know, I just not too long ago, I said something to my wife. I said, you know, Karen, uh, it, it kind of amazes me some of the things that, that, uh, that I'm not particularly big on. And I mentioned earrings. And, and we were talking about some different things, and I said, and that's exactly what I started with. I said, you know, I said, the guy that probably popularized earrings more for men than anybody in the world is Jordan. And I said, now how are you going to fault Jordan wearing an earring? I mean, if, if that's the style, if that's the, the mode, and, and we had a really interesting uh, conversation about that. So you accept earrings now, do you? No, I don't like it. <laughs> I mean, I, I, In 1984, underclassmen turning pro was still somewhat rare. I asked the 21-year-old Michael Jordan what his plans were at that point. The word is that Michael Jordan is going back to North Carolina next year, will not turn pro. Have you definitely made up your mind? Can you say it without equivocation that you're going back? Yes, I think I can. Uh, I am going to go back. Uh, I think Buzz and I, we worked out this deal that... Uh, <laughs> We came in together and we're going to lead together and uh, I guess that's a good statement to have uh, and uh, right now I am going to be coming back. Well I know one very very happy man hearing that tonight is Dean Smith but you can't say the same thing necessarily for Olajuwon. From what you understand Olajuwon might be turning pro? It's possible. You know, um, it, it may not end it the way he wanted it to and uh, I guess that's a big disappointment this early right after the, the, the championship game and you know, you kind of get those thoughts, but, you know, as rational thinking continues, I think he will maybe continue to play at Houston, but, you know, it's a possibility he may go. You never know, yeah. Speaking of disappointments, North Carolina did not win the national title this year, but perhaps you can turn it back and win a gold medal in 84 and make this a banner year anyway.